Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Wishart, and I'm a member of the SPJ's Ethics Committee. And I would like to welcome you to this very important talk today on the on the on the subject of election season and transgender rights reporting responsibly in the divided America. Uh, the discussion will be moderated by my fellow Ethics Committee member, Daniel McLean. And before I hand the microphone over to you, Danielle, I would just like to introduce, of course, a very distinguished uh, panel of, of speakers. So um, first of all, uh, Tat Bellamy Walker is a communities reporter at the Seattle Times. T.J. Billard is Executive Director, Center for Applied Transgender Studies and Assistant Professor at Northwestern University. Christina Carroll is a sports, is the sports editor at the San Francisco Chronicle. And Kate Susan is an LGBTQ plus reporter at the 19th. So over to you, Danielle, and looking forward to a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Eric, and happy Ethics Week, everybody. <laughs> Uh, this is such an honor, honor uh, moderating this amazing panel. Uh, everyone on this panel, including myself, uh, are trans or gender nonconforming um, and are accomplished reporters, editors, and scholars. Uh, I've served as a member of SPJ's Ethics Committee for several years. Um, conducting ethical journalism is difficult. It requires going the extra mile and thinking through your reporting decisions in extremely tight deadlines. But it is absolutely essential, especially when it involves members of underrepresented communities that due to hatred, misunderstanding, or pure politics um, are the target of endless attacks by political campaigns, as well as legislation and regulation. That's the position that trans people in America have been put into today. And that's why it's more crucial than ever that newsrooms are equipped to provide fair and ethical coverage around trans people and have the context needed to navigate the outside resort that has been aimed against them. Um, again, we have such a, a distinguished panel here. I'm gonna start off with the first question that's going to be, uh, I'm gonna pass it around to everyone here, but uh, what are the most common problems with coverage of the trans community that you've seen? Um, I'm gonna start with TJ. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. And um, kicking off with that question, I think the, I, I very easily could spend the entirety of our hour or more kind of answering just that question. <laughs> uh, in general, I would, we've kind of seen, particularly over the last 20 years, as a lot of the, I shall say like style guide problems that we've um, seen in the past have gotten better, right? We've seen, a lot of the things that are easy to kind of educate out as do and don'ts quite easily kind of subside. And what we've kind of been left with in its place is perhaps what I would consider a kind of more insidious anti-transness that um, kind of is easily masked by um, obviously notions of objectivity and balance, uh, questions of, you know, doing due diligence uh, in our thinking, thought experimenting, and of course, uh, exceptionalizing, or sorry, rather normalizing the exceptional uh, and taking, you know, particularly deviant cases and holding them up as the representative instances of uh, what trans existence looks like. Um, and so I think my kind of characterization of uh, the major problems right now have to do with really what the kind of, um, ethical compass for a lot of journalism is around what is the purpose of trans coverage um, and what is it that is a journalist's responsibility to society in providing trans coverage, which I do not think is currently oriented towards achieving understanding, compassion, and you know the best possible uh, material conditions for trans people and is instead oriented, as uh, we'll discuss at great length I'm sure today, around various kind of industrial factors in appeasement of a right wing that uh, uses a uh, kind of mudslinging of uh, me liberal media bias to kind of pull the Overton window in their direction, among other things. And, and that seems to be the kind of guide star for how a lot of journalism uh, covers trans people with, you know, 
we've seen quite like deleterious effects across um, in particular politics, but also culture more broadly. Thank you so much. Um, Kate, do you have um, anything to add to that? You know, I, th I it's so interesting because it. I feel like when it comes to trans people and the way that we report on trans life, so many of the rules about journalism just like kind of fly out the window, right? So, um, you know, the reason why I became a journalist didn't really have to do with LGBTQ plus issues or trans issues, but just issues about people, right? Speaking truth to power, um, holding the powerful to account and reminding us about our humanity. And those um, really basic tenets of journalism, I think, um, should be applied to reporting on trans people, right? Who are the most marginalized in our society, but also are just people. And if we look at facts and we look at experts and what they say about trans people, trans life, trans healthcare, it, the stories I think are pretty clear cut, which is that we hold a line at all of our humanity. Um, and then we use the information and the data that we have in order to inform our stories. So rarely is that done in media right now when we're talking about trans lives and trans people. And it's truly baffling to me when I read stories about trans folks that we engage in this back and forth about should trans people be able to use bathrooms, um, participate in uh, sports, civic life, um, you know, be allowed to move in the world these are not questions that we engage with about people in our world that are humane, right? And so um, as reporters, it feels like a massive failure of journalism to legitimately engage in these kinds of questions, right? It's inhumane to report in this fashion. And so um, for me, I want to step back and go, okay, what are actual facts? What do physicians and, and medical establishment say about this? Um, and why are we getting lost in the noise? Um, I think that's the starting point for me in this conversation. That's great, thank you. Um, Tad, what about you? What are some of the uh, common issues that you've seen with some of the coverage of trans people? Yeah, I, I think for me, what I tend to see is like there's a lack of coverage of um, black trans people. I, I think it's it's very rare that I see, you know, black trans people at, at the center of stories um, around like anti-trans legislation, unless it's, you know, a story about like a black trans woman woman dying. Um, and I think that's very, uh, um, you know, unfortunate. I also have seen like, um, like a constant um, and like hyper focus on trans people's like bodies and our transitions that um, I think can get in the way of news coverage and really, um, uh, I, I feel like in many ways it, it exploits um, trans people, but in many stories that I've I've just come across, I've, I've seen reporters um, like really hyper-focus on trans people's bodies and transitions. Um, and then um, something else that I've seen is just there's a um, a pattern of platforming like misinformation as thinking that you know we have to get both sides, but you know in many ways um, bringing in someone that is like transphobic or, or is um, you know saying information that you know is is um, you know inaccurate like you know it, it gives more power. And, and platforms, um, you know, these inaccurate statements. So sometimes they don't see as much um, diligence when it comes to, um, you know, the the voices that do appear in, in the stories. Yeah, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, and then Christina, um, you coming from the sports perspective, um, uh, what, what are some of the common issues that you have seen? Um, well, I'd say it's almost comes, you know, it almost, take a step back and say like you know it's also about um you know to kind of build on Tat's point as about like you know what I would say are you know the the willful misinformation which plays as part in sports but just in terms of the decision by multiple newsrooms to kind of platform people who are 
you know, ranging from professional concern trolls to, you know, you know, like with like J. Michael Bailey or Jesse Single, you know, to people who, you know, like are literally working for hate groups and working to, you know, essentially take civil rights away from transgender people and making those equivalent and, and, you know, with the idea of, you know, that they have something to say to medical experts or on the subject of, you know, trans existence, which is, you know, deeply problematic. But, you know, what's misinformative in the sports perspective are these kinds of ingrained assumptions about, you know, anything from, you know, a normal, you know, human hormone like testosterone and its role in, in sports performance, where you end up with study after study that says there is not a direct, you know, you know, one for one relationship between testosterone levels and sports performance. Um, and, you know, this assumption that women don't have testosterone when it's a naturally occurring hormone in all human beings. And then, you know, this kind of assumption that, you know, male to female transgender people are going to dominate in sports uh, when they don't and haven't, uh, that this is something very new when as a public policy matter, you know, trans people have been included, whether in Olympic competition going back, you know, 20 years, or, you know, like even in school sports and, you know, just places like the LA Unified School District, um, you know, going back 15 years in youth sports. I mean, at this point, they've graduated, you know, a million kids in one of the largest school districts in the country and integrated trans participation in PE and school sports. And not only did you not see a bunch of LA USD schools, uh, you know, dominating girls sports um, as a result of participation of trans athletes, um, you also didn't see you know, this, you, you, all of the scare tactics or the, you know, this is new, too new and too dangerous and too horrible, and we can't possibly consider it. And what might possibly happen? Well, we already have positive case studies, which, you know, like in examples that basically tell us none of those things happen. And if you actually leave it to, you know, educators, parents, and, and coaches and athletes, that they come up with the right solutions and they work, and none of the bad things that people anticipate have happened. So like the scaremongering and the proposition that we don't know anything about this and we don't know what will happen. Actually, we do. Bad things don't happen as a result. And so it's kind of, you know, the fact that we ignore public policy success uh, essentially to continue to scaremonger on the subject of trans people in public life is, and why that's continued to be enabled, again, I think goes back to, to task point of, of, you know, that we're enabling a side of the conversation that has literally not only no standing, but no legitimacy in terms of, of whether you talk about data or anecdotal evidence. Awesome, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, this question is for TJ. Um, in general, how has the media's coverage of trans people and the political discourse surrounding the population affected both the rights and the health of trans people? And do you believe journalism schools are providing graduates with the necessary skills to cover the trans community responsibly? Great. I'll answer the second question first because it's a very quick answer. And the answer, as you sure. all <laughs> know, is no. But it's also no in a in a broader context. It's it's not just no journalism schools are you know, doing wrong by trans people. Uh, I, journalism schools, on the whole, don't that provide little to no kind of culturally competent education in coverage of racial and ethnic minorities, of covering uh, gender minorities, of covering sexual minorities, they're really covering most topics. And the vast majority of journalism education is in many ways focused in educating and, and kind of inculcating values that are kind of often at direct odds with the ability to represent present minoritized and marginalized communities well because of the ways they shore up particular relationships to the state, to institutions of power, to uh, certain norms that are frequently exploited by those in power in order to uh, kind of uh, allow for discourse to be dominated by certain um, kind of normative perspectives. And so, uh, yeah, no is the short answer. Um, in terms of speaking to um, how media coverage of trans people um, and that kind of political discourse affects the rights and health of trans people, I would say it's not so easy as drawing like a one-to-one -one relationship between there is media coverage and then bad things happen. I think it's a lot more of a complicated dynamic. 
But I think that what is very evident uh, is at a minimum, if media coverage is not affecting public opinion uh, and the policies uh, that get implemented to affect trans people, they at the very least legitimate anti-trans political perspectives as part of what can be considered reasonable and acceptable public debate. And that, even if it has no other effect, is a major effect that is a problem. It says that, well, one political party is introducing certain legislation and they say that this is why and we are going to report it because that is what of reporters do. And it says to the public that, oh, I guess that's a legitimate political uh, opinion that somebody can hold and that oh, this thing that they are saying is a problem must be a problem because uh, I just got told that a bill is being introduced uh, about it. And I think that um, part of the the issue that we see there is um, about not just misinformation, which is a major problem uh, on the fact side, but also this kind of more insidious kind of discursive thing that is going on because disinformation is never just about trying to get people to believe wrong facts, right? It's disinformation is useful because of the way they serve as these building blocks into bigger cultural narratives and cultural narratives that very frequently are not explicitly challenged. So we see things like, um, I think the sports example is a good one where um, we see conversations about, okay, um, you know, here are a bunch of misinformed claims about like, the biology of transition and how that affects athletic performance. But what that coverage very rarely, I would say, I wouldn't say never, but I'm pretty sure close to it. Um, we don't see stories that say, oh, okay, actually, um, we're being told that uh, trans women's athletic performance is the reason why, for example, because this keeps getting brought up, uh, young women are not able to get scholarship opportunities because they lost to a trans woman and now they can't go to college. It's like, okay, maybe the problem here, even if a trans woman is outperforming someone, is actually, you know, the financing of opportunities for uh, educational achievement. Or maybe the problem is the under-resourcing, despite Title IX, of uh, women's and girls' athletics. And there are these structural problems where it's very much like, oh, that trans woman standing in my way, instead of saying, hey, this structure is actually unequal. And that's the root problem here. And we allow, short sure, disinformation, but the bigger problem is we allow the finger to be pointed to say, trans women are the problem, instead of pointing and like, actually the problem is this other kind of systemic inequality. It doesn't, um, and it doesn't look at things like when we're talking about youth sports participation, where if you want to get into a debate about the biology of athletic performance in elite athletics, you're wrong, but fine, have that debate. But when we're talking about elementary, middle, and even to a certain extent, high school athletics, this isn't the Olympics. Right, like people are not there to compete because like the ultimate goal is I must be the greatest uh, athletic champion ever. The point is to have friends, to participate in community life at your school and in your town. It is, and the efforts to exclude are not because you're really worried about whether that six-year-old t-ball team is gonna be fair. The point is we don't want trans kids socializing with cis kids. We don't want trans kids to exist, much less to be an accepted part of society. And we want to create these siloings. And the coverage of the debate is never a coverage of what is actually being done, which is we are attempting to socially isolate trans people. It instead plays into that debate of, oh, let the debate uh, the science of if uh, this six-year-old should be playing T-ball. And so yeah. I think those harms are not just about politics and health in that kind of a direct way, but really are about these types of um, social narrative buildings that we're not challenging that really have uh, profoundly negative effects on what it means to be a trans person in society in everyday life. Uh, building off that, uh, in uh, this question is for Kate, and I know in many ways this year's election will shape the laws governing the rights of trans people. Um, Kate, you've done extensive reporting on this front. What are some of those major trans related issues that voters will see on the ballot this year? And how might these issues impact voting decisions made by trans voters? 
You know, it's a complicated question because, you know, we do, obviously there are ballot measures, right? But I think bigger than that, um, in terms of what people will be voting for, is what candidates can people stomach supporting? And will mm -hmm. people be able to bring themselves to vote for anti-trans candidates? And is that an issue that they will vote on? Um, and I have a question, and I think a lot of us have a question about, especially in red states, um, will people who have friends or family who are LGBTQ+, plus, um, but are Republican, be able to vote for these candidates who are vehemently anti-trans, vehemently anti-LGBTQ+, even if their politics align in other ways? There's a real question that I have, and I think that a lot of other people have about why is this a campaign issue this year? Um, why is it that GOP lawmakers in these states are pushing anti-LGBTQ plus bills because poll after poll shows that they're not popular. They only appeal to a small, small sliver of a far right base. Um, and so I think that we're reaching a point where a lot of people in this country have to decide what are the issues that you vote on? For a lot of us, it's issues that face us daily. It's the economy, you know, um, it's, you know, if I go to the gas tank, you know, can I support my kids? Can I get groceries? Things like that. Um, and it's not going to be like, hey, this kid that I can't possibly picture because I don't know a lot of trans people in a state I don't know about, could that kid um, possibly be in a bathroom, right? Like that's not an issue that a lot of Americans are going to vote on. But if you have a gay son or a trans niece, you might find it hard to vote against that person. And I think that is what this election is going to come down to. And I'm not sure that Republicans in these states are thinking through that. I think that we're going to find that this country is a lot more diverse and complicated than we really um, are giving folks credit for. And so, um, I'm very curious to see how these anti-LGBTQ plus candidates are going to fare over time. And I think we're starting to reach a point where um, this is a losing strategy. Um, so it, I do think, yes, we have these issues of sports, right? We have healthcare um, and it feels like these are losing issues for LGBTQ plus people right now in a lot of states that are red. Um, but I think in terms of the candidates that are carrying them, I think long-term you're going to see a fall off of those candidates because it, in terms of the polling, it's just not there that the public supports this. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Tat, you've, uh, done, you've written a lot about the impact that anti-drag policies and gending affirming care bans for trans, trans youth have had in recent years, what are some of those common themes that you've noticed and what kind of impact have those laws had on members of the trans community? Yeah, that's um, that's a great question. Um, I would say like, you know, the, the most recent family that I, you know, that I interviewed, they just mentioned just being scared and just having to, you know, move their entire life from, you know, from Austin, Texas to like to the Seattle area. Um, it cost them a lot. Um, you know, their their daughter um, at first was like initially like very scared about moving from the only place um, that, you know, that she knew. Um, like in an interview, um, she told me like um, that, you know, just let them hurt me, you know, because she did not want to 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 move. But the the legislation and policies just became so tense that the family's um, entire life. They just didn't have much of an option. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing families are just very, are very scared um, about the policies that are coming up in their in their states. But I'm also seeing that, um, you know, families talk about the, the heavy like financial burden and, and risk. Um, like for the family that, that I interviewed, they mentioned it cost them like $20,000, um, you know, to, to move their entire life. And when I'm speaking to, to advocates about this, um, they mentioned, you know, like there is a these large disparities on who gets to move. And I think that is something um, 
that, you know, there could be more reporting on who actually gets to move. There are a lot of people that don't have the, um, you know, the finances or the ability to facilitate the move and are stuck in places with um, anti-trans um, legislation or policies that, you know, affect how they navigate um, their life and their ability to, to thrive. Um, I, I feel like the other theme that has come up is that even, you know, with, you know, Washington not having any um, anti-drag laws, um, the anti-drag rhetoric nationally still had a really big impact on the performers in, in Washington. Um, I remember, you know, speaking to one performer who spoke about how um, she was performing at a local library in Washington and there was like this, this um, anti-trans um, or conservative group that came up and actually started filming her doing her set. And that, you know, that video of that set actually, um, you know, appeared in a clip on Fox News. Um, and there's, you know, and I was able to speak to her about what that, the, uh, uh, you know, about the impact that had on her life, how she was just doing a performance in drag and, um, you know, the clip of that performance at a local library in Washington ended up on, on Fox News, um, creating this whirlwind of like harassment that, um, that, she, that she faced. So even with places that don't have, you know, anti-drag like laws or policies, a lot of folks on the ground are still being like impacted, um, you know, whether it's through, you know, the, you know, the person that I, you know, interviewed or just drag performers feeling more, um, you know, scared um, about, you know, trying, you know, trying to, um, you know, fight for, for their craft at this time. So those are some of the themes that I see um, come up in my, in my, in my reporting. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Some really great perspective. Uh, question for Christina. Uh, trans athletes have, oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you hear me? Um, this question is for Christina. Trans athletes have been the target of a lot of hate, regulation, and legislation in recent years. Uh, this issue is particularly near and dear to my heart. I'm a uh, trans woman who plays uh, women's ice hockey. So, um, but more at the adult level, that's not being legislated, um, as far as I know. Uh, Christina, as the sports editor, how have um, newsrooms fallen short in their coverage of trans athletes? And uh, how can newsrooms like yours provide better coverage around the issue, especially given the political animosity directed towards the few trans athletes that actually do compete? Yeah, I think the interesting thing here is the way in which people have gotten a little over focused on the trans athletes themselves as opposed to the trans athlete experience competing with, against, alongside, you know, cisgender athletes. One of the things that usually, you know, like in the way that, you know, journalism or a lot of news coverage around trans people, you know, almost inevitably risks othering trans people and making setting them aside from the audience and taking them outside of the audience and making them something uh different instead what you find as far as the the lived experience of you know and kind of the aspirational goal of athletes of any age is that they're looking for that fellowship that competition that camaraderie they're looking for you know the the values that sports are supposed to inculcate as far as like whether it's teamwork or striving for individual excellence. And the, the, those are universally human qualities. Um, and so some of that just seems to be, you know, you know, it gets back into this question of framing trans people as somebody, as a community of people who are trying to put one over on people or get a leg up or cheat or, and, and all of which is just, you know, not merely not true, but also is about, you know, framing trans people as someone who wants to mislead you um, when trans people are just looking for the same human experiences that everybody else is and what they want out of being an athlete are the same things and they should be unifying themes and unifying experiences. Um, the thing that I found in my, you know, when I was reporting on issues about trans people for ESPN, you know, was that the competitors, um, you know, and teammates of a trans athlete like Chris Mosier for Team USA, you know, there was nothing but profound respect, both for the motivations, the goals, 
uh, putting in the work. I mean, that, that the respect among athletes was a universal experience. And that, I think, is something that, you know, certainly should feature more in terms of coverage of trans athletes is the way, extent to which, you know, they are welcomed and or embraced by teammates as, you know, as opposed to focusing on the people who are freaking out about the fact that there are trans athletes and, you know, that, and people like, you know, whether you want to talk about Riley Gaines or, you know, athletes who are outraged about having to participate with or against trans athletes, um, you know, generally speaking, that's again, kind of focusing on a minority view as opposed to the almost universal acceptance that trans athletes, you know, end up feeling and, and enjoying the benefit of. And so it's it's about, you know, the newsroom's readiness to kind of embrace this, you know, we're gonna teach the controversy kind of approach to trans issues in sports. And it's like, well, you know, that there shouldn't be, con you're, you're creating this controversy essentially by elevating and equating and treating this as a both sides issue, as opposed to just saying like, kid plays youth soccer, things didn't happen other than youth soccer, surprise. And, you know, or that, you know, competition across genders in Little League, you know, is a non-story. I mean, you know, like going back to, you know, you didn't need the bad news bears to, to you know, kind of bring that home. But, you know, the idea that kids just want to play and compete and compete with each other and want that essentially normalizing experience and, and want the same things that the kids in their neighborhoods want uh, in their schools. It just, it seems very, it's a fundamental problem of, you know, the media readiness to frame trans as other and code trans people as other, as opposed to saying that they are just athletes and individuals pursuing the same things as everybody else. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it, uh, Christina. Uh, and apologies if I'm cutting in and out. I'm having some technical difficulties on my end, but uh, hopefully it hasn't been too much of a disturbance. Um, I got a question from James May. Uh, uh, James said, I am a non-binary freelance journalist. I just want to clarify. So I'm hearing that instead of forecast, uh, forecasting so much of on the transness of a story uh, of focusing on so much of the transness of the story, we can focus on the can you answer that one. Would you like me to repeat the question? So James is a non-binary freelance journalist. Um, they want to clarify. So, uh, James said, I'm hearing that instead of for, uh, focusing so much on the transness of a story, we can focus on the social political aspects of the story. Is that correct? So what do you want to take that on and clarify? Can you just go, because I, I think like that I can see how that came out of something that I said. I, I'm not, I wasn't saying in my specific case that I think that we should focus on that instead of trans people. I, I was saying, I feel like trans people are often scapegoated or, uh, in contexts where there are systemic social and political issues and that it is very, um, very infrequent that, that I've seen journalists say, okay, you might be complaining about the, the trans person in this context, but that person is not the problem. That is not where the story is. The story is not trans person creates problems for women's sports. The problem is, you know, uh, the problem is uh, collegiate sports are underfunded. The, the, um, I'm, the problem is Caitlin Clark is going to get paid, you know, $76,000 and that's uh, exceptional amounts of money uh, to go pro when uh, the men are bringing in like probably hundreds of millions of, I don't know if anyone watch baseball, uh, basketball, but I know that it's in the millions, uh, maybe not hundreds. But the point is that like there are real systemic inequities and trans people are being pointed to as the cause of them instead of reporters going, no, I'm not falling into that trap. There is a problem here that I will report um, and it's not the trans person. But I do think we need coverage that is specifically about trans people and the oftentimes very unique 
oftentimes very common uh, social, political, and health problems that we face. And um, so absolutely, we do need a lot of trans-specific coverage. That's great. Um, a question for, you know, the panel here, um, you know, what are some strategies that reporters can take when they are, um, you know, perhaps heading into an interview with um, a trans person and making sure that, you know, they can, um, you know, properly interview them without, um, uh, you know, offending them or, um, you know, making sure that they, you know, go into the interview, um, you know, acknowledging their existence as a trans person um, and, and not offend them. Well, I mean, I have some like very like simple um, tips. I mean, you can always just ask folks for their their pronouns. You can like first, I would you know recommend you introducing yourself with your pronouns, and you know, and then asking them you know during the interview like, oh, you know, what's your name, um, age, and then you know, and then pronouns. Um, I think that is like one great way to um, you know create trust, at least in my. Um, experience some stories I work on are not exclusively about trans people but um, there are trans sources in the story and they will let me know that in other um, stories with with other news outlets that you know the reporters have been misgendering them please um, get you know our pronouns right in in the story um, so that is that is definitely really important and also I, I would respect the name that um, you know someone is giving. Um, to you. Um, I think oftentimes, like, um, you know, you know, there could be some some issues or so that can come up with folks's, um, you know, the, you know, the name that, you know, they, you know, they go by and then, you know, maybe um, official records or, you know, or IDs may have like a birth name. I would also just go by like the name that they're, they're telling you. Uh, as that is like the most like authentic representation of of them, um, and then yeah, those are like some of my my quick tips for interviewing uh, like trans people. That's great. Anyone anyone else have any uh, advice? That was all really great. Well, I, I will throw in the snarky comment that if you are a journalist who is interviewing a trans person for a story about trans people, you're already doing better than an awful lot of mainstream outlets, which basically exclude trans people from stories about them. And it's like whether as a matter of public policy or as a matter of, you know, like just, you know, again, kind of inflating this de debate about the trans existence um, in which trans voices are entirely excluded. So, you know, like I would encourage people that if you're doing a story about trans people, one, yes, absolutely include trans people. And then two, own your ignorance. It's okay to not know everything about trans people going into the subject because in a sense, you you need to lean into the fact that you are not a subject expert as a journalist and that you do want to, if you are going to appropriately you know, educate your audience about it, that you're gonna do your homework. And some of that means that, you know, like not coming into it with just well, you know, this is how the Times has chosen to report on the subject, and therefore I know something about it. And it's like, no, are you maybe you need to spend some time talking and looking at what you know medical professionals have to say and what trans people have to say before you really, you know, embrace your responsibility ability to responsibly report a story about transgender people. I want to add to that just because I um I'm working on a lot of research right now that's specifically looking at a lot of the misinformation about trans youth. Um, and I think that what uh, Christina is saying like does not just apply to the voices of trans adults, but also very specifically does apply to the voices of trans youth. And I know that uh, youth and children are infrequently allowed to speak on uh, in their own right in a variety of contexts that this is not something that is, you know, specific to how journalists treat trans people, but it is a cultural problem that 
that is creating issues for public understanding of and for accurate reporting about trans youth. Uh, and I think it, it is a problem that we kind of deny trans youth self-knowledge, that we deny them authority over their own experience, uh, and that we deny them the opportunity to speak to um, their material experiences. And we see that very frequently in cases where someone interviews the parent of a trans kid who's panicked that their kid it is trans and then the story gets framed in the context of this trans parents oftentimes ignorant sometimes very hateful perspective on their own child instead of speaking to what the experience of being trans as a young person actually are and what their realities are and I know that there are a lot of logistical and professional and other issues wrapped up in that but I do think it is imperative that as an industry journalism finds ways to be more truthful more honest um, and more um, kind of affirming of trans youth's experiences of their own lives. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and if anybody in the audience has a question for any of our panelists, uh, please just uh, enter it in the chat and I'll try to get to it. Um, we have a, about 20 more minutes here. Um, uh, I guess, you know, one, you know, here, one question here for the panel again, um, uh, you know, a reporter might say, I'm just doing a story on the polls surrounding, you know, trans trans people since it's, a, you know, it's a political issue. Uh, you know, why would I need to see comment from a trans person? It's just purely on the horse race coverage of it. What what are the, what are the, you know, who, does anybody want to, you know, kind of talk about the, you know, importance of seeking a uh, comment from a trans person um, during, you know, quick political horse race coverage that you'll be seeing a lot of in the run up to the election. Well, I mean, I guess I'll jump in here. One, um, you don't have to. Um, <laughs> obviously, a lot of newspapers don't. Um, most, I would say. Um, your story is worse for it, first of all. like. Um, you know it's um it's a it's just a better story um with trans voices um it's a better reported story um and you miss a lot when you don't talk to trans people about trans experiences it's just um it's less interesting um and it's factually um incorrect usually <laughs> if you don't talk to trans people about trans stories um what you're getting is usually just wrong um so which is why um so much of our mainstream coverage has um come under fire recently um so yeah one it's just due diligence it makes sense to interview trans people about trans stories um but usually uh you know if you have trans sources especially a combination of trans experts and then trans people who are living the experiences that you're talking about you're going to get people who are going to point stuff out to you that you did not realize that will make your story so much richer, deeper, um, and way more readable. Um, it's just a vastly different story than if you have um, a bunch of cis people talking about data. Um, it's quite boring, um, I think, to read that story versus one that brings in um, people who know a thing about it. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, this question is from our esteemed ethics committee chair, Fred Brown. Um, abortion rights supporters, as well as opponents, have attempted to codify their positions in law or even state constitutions through ballot issues. Most of these have ended up ended in victory for abortion rights supporters. Do you see either side, pro or anti-trans rights, using ballot issues as a way to drive voter turnout and support their position? And what are the risks and side effects to that? Look, we've seen this for years. Um, it, this has been an ongoing thing. Um, and I think it's a great question. Um, so the answer is yes. Since 2015, when marriage equality became the law of the land for the Supreme Court, we did start to see these ballot initiatives. Um, they started around bathrooms for the most part. Um, 
And the bathroom issue proved to be largely unsuccessful. So they pivoted to these other issues and um, trying, so they moved from trying to push trans people out of bathrooms and undo anti-discrimination protections. We saw that in Alaska and Massachusetts, and then it moved on to healthcare and sports. Um, and now we're coming back to bathrooms, right? And there's been this huge push. Um, Yes, I think we will see these ballot initiatives, but um, one, will the electorate go for that? I mean, most people, depending on how you word it, will not vote to kick people out of bathrooms or bar them from participating in civic life. You have to be careful to word it so that it, they don't know that that's what they're voting for. So you're going to have to say, I vote to keep men out of women's restrooms so you have to misgender the trans person in in the question in order to get right and two you know I, I think that like there is it is fundamentally difficult for people to vote to strip away a right that has already been um given to people um and it, it, we're seeing that with abortion um, and um, this fight for bodily autonomy. I think um, we're finding it in terms of abortion um, and in terms of access to gender affirming care. If you're going to put that in the hands of people who are voting, um, I don't know how much success we're going to find um, among the electorate um, and a taste for for blocking people's rights. So uh, that uh, they there has been an attempt to do that. And, uh, and it, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, that just has not been wildly successful. And I think that's why we're seeing it in state legislatures, right? Um, because e in places, even deep red places, the appetite to do that just hasn't been there um, among the electorate. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else have any uh, anything to add to that question? I guess I would add on the pro-trans side that um, I don't see ballot initiatives being a major push there um, as a strategy the way it has around abortion rights, but largely because um, I, abortion is unique in a couple ways. One of it, one of those being the fact that. Um, it not only affects the entire population, but uh, over half the population is able to and potentially desirous of seeking abortions. Right. And that if we look across the, the two parties, it is also one of the issues that Republican women break from Republican men most strongly in their proportion of support. So I think abortion um, protections as, as in ballot initiatives have just so much more calculus set up for them to be successful. I think that as much as I, uh, Kay is totally right, there is not actually the appetite uh, for anti-trans ballot initiatives that will actually drive people to the polls. Um, there is most certainly not enough pro-trans support uh, to drive uh, people to the polls, um, as much as it would be wonderful uh, if there could be. Great, thank you. Um... I guess uh, another question I'm kind of thinking of here is, um, you know, one, you know, often you see, um, often you see kind of a lot of the news cycle focus around an individual trans person for doing something that kind of generated some outrage or, you know, um, you know, something I, there's probably a huge draw for a lot of news organizations to, you know, not you know, miss out on the news coverage and, you know, um, feel like they're leaving their readers hanging. Um, one person, like one in, uh, in particular person that it's coming to mind is, um, is Leah Thomas after winning like an individual race. And there was a lot of just articles and, you know, very like prominent news outlets that are commenting on Leah's body and uh, physique and, um, you know, there's an oversized spotlight being placed on um, this individual winning a single race and um, kind of what that means for trans rights in sports. You know, what are some of the ethical implications that journal journalists, journal newsrooms kind of need to adhere to and um, think about when they are um, 
thinking about covering, uh, you know, a particular individual such as this. Well, I think, you know, this is one of those things where, um, I mean, I, I would expand it even beyond trans people and, and bring up like athletes, whether, you know, like intersex athletes, historically, whether you want to go all the way back to Stella Walsh, like, you know, meddling in the 1932 and 36 Olympics to uh, Castro Semenya. And, you know, like this gets into um, questions about, again, this kind of, you know, they have the right to compete. And we've embraced that um you know that they're allowed but then like you know that that you know essentially like they well instead of ask celebrating i mean particularly semenya it seems particularly you know uh problematic or or traumatic that um you know instead of celebrating the fact that that she won um people are instead i think well it's really unfair that somebody as good as she is uh is allowed to compete um and we're going to find ways to make sure she can't, or we're going to handicap her, which is, you know, and fundamentally antithetical to the, the, you know, kind of organizing principles of sports. So it's, you know, like looking at Leah, Leah, you know, like I again, I'm sort of, you know, struck by the fact that everybody was upset about her participation and her transient success. Um, you know, not a lot of them were framing it in the context of, yeah, and what she did really, you know, like, it's nice, but, uh, and it's a success, but, you know, like, if you're going to freak out about trans participation in sports, you know, then let's just also remember, she has, she stands zero chance against Katie Ledecky in the pool, that, like, you know, that there are cisgender, you know, like the elite cisgender swimmers in the planet would still completely smoker in the pool so like why are we like obsessed with Leah Thomas beating one particular or like you know making sure Riley Gaines finished fifth instead of fourth or whatever you know like why are we obsessing over that as a talking point and it's ultimately I think has very little to do with sports per se and more about again this kind of like initiative to demonize trans people and use them as a wedge issue politically and to create this you know like essentially you know, in the absence of coherent, you know, domestic or foreign policy or economic policy or anything else, instead, just trying to create a monster in your narrative and then say we're against that and basically putting trans people in that box. And it's it's a little nuts, but, you know, like if you've got nothing else, that's what they're, go they're going to in terms of political conversations and waging the culture war. And, you know, because they think maybe that will at least make them seem plausible as opposed to talking about, you know, real issues and more general issues that I think going back to what Kate was saying earlier about like, you know, what if, whether you want to call them the kitchen table political issues, you know, we, we've we kind of, you know, divorced ourselves from that kind of political conversation in this kind of obsession from one sector of the political commentary about, um, you know, state of politics in this country, that, that they're obsessed with talking about this stuff as opposed to hard nuts and bolts, like, you know, reporting on politics or public policy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great response. Um, this comment, this question is actually from our esteemed vice president, SBJ's esteemed vice president, Emily Bach. Uh, uh, she said, thank you so much for offering this webinar. I, um, I'll be doing general person on the street polling place interviews on election day. Any advice to ensure I'm interviewing a diverse range of sources, including queer voices when so much of the day and who talks to me is left to chance? Clock everyone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, you know i i think um you you know when you're out interviewing obviously it's important to like try to talk to a, a number of different people obviously but that's that's so obvious and you're a great reporter so you know that um one thing i like to do before i 
go out and do stuff like that is also to try to do specific reach outs, whether it's to organizations or specific people that I know are going to be out and try to meet up with them um, to make sure that I have some kind of people built in throughout the day so that I know that I'm going to have those stops along the way or people that I know are going to call me throughout the day um, who fit into those um who are people that I I want to talk to um and can comment on those issues, right? So like um for LGBTQ plus coverage, if I know that I'm like, I want to know how people are going to do in Florida voting, given the fact that this ID law is in place, I'm gonna touch base with like five voters in Florida who are, you know, gonna have to navigate this and say, hey, when you vote, can you just call me after you vote or whatever and just have those people lined up? And so um, is it perfect in terms of finding people immediately on the street? No, but it does for me like kind of create that net um, throughout and just say like, okay, if I can check in with this org and this org and this org and say, can you put me in touch with someone on this day who X, Y, and Z usually that kind of helps me in terms of making sure that I'm casting a net that is wide um, for that coverage. I'm not sure if that's helpful. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We're running out of time. We have one more question from the audience. Um, this is from Eric Weiser. Um, uh, how would you recommend uh, journalists uh, cover anti-trans rhetoric, particularly when it comes from politicians and other public figures? The public has a right to know what their position is on most on this most important question. So how can you report or frame it without giving a platform to anti-trans sentiment or even hate? Yeah, I mean, like one suggestion that I have is like, if you're like, you know, talking to a politician that, you know, um, you know is saying like anti-trans, you know, rhetoric, uh, I would also, I would, like if you have the ability to talk to that, politician and interact with that politician, I would definitely ask a politician, like, you know, what is your, like, response to community members that, you know, will say that, you know, what you're saying is transphobic or, you know, I would just fact check them and also, like, real time, if, if you can, like, say if they're saying something about, um, you know, trans, trans youth and, you know, their access to gender affirming care, you know, you could, you, you know, you could you cite, like, information from, you know, uh, WPATH, you know, there's like different information that you can like cite as well that I think would be helpful like during like the interview with that like politician or, or you know, figure and like in the story to counter like, you know, what the, um, you know, what experts are saying. Uh, I think that is like a way that could be helpful and just also pushing back against the, um, you know, the politicians like state. I would also say, I think with public figures, I think it's a little weirder because like, I actually don't know that we need to know what the public figures think about trans people. Like I think of someone like JK Rowling where it's like, it is not pertinent to why she's famous or what her profession is or the things she publishes, the, what she says on Twitter about trans people. It's not doing anyone any good, certainly not her for that to be in the news all the time. Um, but when it comes to politicians, I, I think sometimes it is quite simply about like, if a politician says, I think trans people are gross. Okay, sure. That's their opinion. They said it in public. Politicians get repeated. But if they're going to say, um, you know, trans youth participation in sports is a threat to our public school athletic system, the subsequent se sentence needs to be, in the last 15 years, there have not been any trans athletes that have competed in this, if that's the case, as is the case in many states or and also um, medical experts agree that this is not an issue in, for these reasons or when a bill is um has people testifying in favor of it and they're from the american college of pediatrics which is not only a recognized hate group but also a lot of medical fraudsters that the medical community has outright denounced then that needs to be the tag after saying american college of pediatrics instead of the sentence just ending there and the public sees i don't know some pediatricians who have this fancy little name that makes it sound like they're real experts said this thing it must be that doctors are divided when it's not doctors are divided it's that some doctors lack ethics and have created fraudulent organizations and I 
I think what is the problem is about the due diligence of ensuring the truthfulness of claims that are represented and of not being explicit about when falsehoods are being um, uttered in defense of certain political positions by people in power. Yeah, look at the, you know, like the exclusion of trans people from the military, like, you know, in eight years ago when that was attempted as a public policy um, and the re rationales that were advanced sounded patriotic and concerned for national defense. And, you know, like because they were designed to be that way. But, and nevertheless, you had the five joint chiefs of staff saying, no, there's no problem. Trans people have do not create a problem for unit cohesion. There is not a problem with other soldiers working with trans soldiers. There is not, none of this is true. So, you know, like if on the one hand, you're not going to listen to the people in the military or the trans soldiers themselves, but you are going to listen to Mike Pence on this subject, then, you know, like you, you really have kind of abdicated your responsibility as a journalist to, you know, write sensibly about this story. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. And I guess we're, we're just pretty much out of time, but I just want to ask one quick wrap up question. Um, you know, kind of going around the room here, um, uh, you know, what kind of resources um, can journalists, you know, tap into or what kind of advice do you have um, for, you know, journalists and newsrooms looking to improve their coverage of trans people, of uh, trans people during the election? Yeah, I mean, one, of, one piece of advice that I have is like using SPJ's um, like race and gender hotline. Um, that is like a great resource um, if you need like um, like feedback on a story. Um, so I, that's something that I would do or implementing like other like sensitivity channels or sensitivity reads um, into your like editing process or, or work. Great. Uh, Kate, Kate, did you uh, have something to add as well? Yeah, I mean, obviously I love uh, TJ as a resource. Um, the Trans Journalists Association. And then the other recommendation I'll make is, um, I feel like a lot of journalists have stopped using this as a resource, but I, I would like to just put it back front and center. You know, um, the folks at GLAAD, their um, transgender um, media rep, um, Alex Schmitter, is, he's just a friend of mine. Um, I go to him often and make him read things. Um, and just ask him for advice. Um, and a lot of times I feel like if you need that help or support, that is a free resource that is available to journalists, especially if you are cisgender. Um, so I would encourage people to use that um, because they will do that for you. And I will Amazing. pivot off of that and add that one of the other things, in addition to endorsing TJ and endorsing having conversations, one of the great ways to have conversations, I know it's tough in this media environment with as many newsrooms shrinking, are hire trans journalists. If you want diversity and perspective in your newsrooms, bring them in. And that way you can have that conversation. Anybody who is a journalist, you know, is ready for a rough conversation, for understandably ignorant questions, tough questions. You got to start somewhere. A journalist is going to be somebody who's going to be able to have that conversation with you and not be afraid of like what you don't know and is going to be able to get you to the place where you need to be to execute your story as well. What better way to do that than to have a coworker who can answer your questions? There are many out there. <laughs> can confirm. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll also just add as another uh, plug of a, related to ourselves. Um, I run a nonprofit uh, based in Chicago called the Center for Applied Transgender Studies, uh, which is very lucky to boast 40 of the world's leading trans scholars, um, all of whom are experts in trans topics. And we have people who range from experts in literature and culture through to neuroscientists. Um, and all of our uh, experts are qualified, credentialed academic researchers. Uh, and we have a a uh, website you can use and a uh, press contact that you can reach out to to ensure uh, that we can connect you with uh, an expert uh, who can fact check for you or even present you with um, some of their own research findings about a lot of the important topics being discussed in media right now. Amazing, thank you. And I would be remiss if I did not mention following the code of ethics, SPJs, as uh, long lasting and um, just 
pure, amazing uh, code of ethics, just following and adhering to those principles could go a long way. Um, but saying that, thank you all so much for your participation in this panel, um, joining in at home and uh, in the office. I uh, really appreciate it. Really great discussion. All right. Thank you, everyone.